Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome all to uh, this webinar in our digital maturity series. Today, we're focusing on the operational side of things. Uh, Operations Rebooted is the title. Uh, I'm Mark Walker-Smith. I'm head of EMEA for Digitopia. Uh, we're a management consultancy working with our customers on digital transformation, but with a real specialism and years of experience in the whole digital maturity space. Um, so that's me. I'm joined today by three esteemed colleagues, uh, experts in digital and financial services and digital maturity, Robin, Jesus and Amir. And I'll just quickly hand over to those guys just to introduce themselves uh, uh, before we get fully underway. Robin? Uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Robin Peters. Um, I have recently left uh, Aviva where I was part of the startup team um, that established UK Digital as a, um, a standalone business within uh, Aviva uh, in the UK, uh, accountable for the direct to consumer business and uh, all the digital assets uh, with a revenue of about uh, 1.3 billion pounds. Um, prior to that, I was uh, had fairly broad experience in strategy and business development across multiple sectors and geographies. Thank you. Uh Jesus, do you want to go next? Um, hi, guys. Good morning, good evening, uh, good afternoon, wherever you, you, you see, <laughs> you're coming from, uh, seeing us from. Um, my name is Jesus. I lead the digital fintech uh, team at Grant Thornton. We run three main programs. Uh, one is around open banking, um, where we, everything really started, we're going to discuss today. And then we, the second program is open finance program which we're going to talk a touch on, on today as well, an open data program. Before that, I've been in the financial service industry for over a decade, started the FinTech too, have my scars on that, and we'll be sharing that too as well today. Excellent. Thank you, Jesus. And Emir? Yeah, hello, everybody. Um, I, I'm Emir. I work as a senior consulting manager at Digitopia, focusing majorly on digital transformation projects. Uh, prior to that, I worked at leading banks in Turkey and also in global consultancy companies. And I've got uh, 15 years of total work experience. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so uh, really, the guys are going to be the focus of the uh, discussion today. I'm uh, here mainly in moderation mode and to uh, carry the bags or whatever they say. But um, what I thought I'd do just before I sort of hand over uh, to the panel, really, for, for their thoughts on the whole piece around digital maturity operations and everything that sits within that is just sort of set the scene a little bit um, and uh, talk a little bit about how we at Digitopia see the sort of world of digital transformation and particularly how digital maturity fits uh, as a critical part of, uh, of running those kind of programs. Um, this is a diagram that probably we're all familiar with and particularly at the moment the uncertainty piece uh, it, we're all experiencing that in our personal lives let alone our professional lives but um, this has been the world a world in flux for, for many years now um, so there's all sorts of things that organizations are having to cope with. Customer expectations are changing all the time and particularly in recent months probably accelerated uh, digital strategy, uh, competition, uh, technological changes and, and keeping up with the latest things uh, and your competition obviously is, is, is a, real, uh, a real issue. We've seen over a number of years what we might call the waves of digitalization moving from particularly in the operation space, process optimization and process re-engineering through to you know clearly a lot of business-led um, which is as it should be uh, in some ways, uh, you know, new models, uh, subscription models, platform businesses, very much a customer centric view of the world. But underpinning all of this, uh, the vast majority of this is, is operational capabilities, uh, whether it's around processes or how you ultimately interact with your customers, efficiencies, etc. cetera. We, we try and frame this as um, leaders in this space uh, are gonna have what we call digital superpowers. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we categorize it into sort of four key areas, speed design, intelligence, connectivity. But again, the operational aspect uh, of an organization is, is underpinning an awful lot of this, whether it's integration quite specifically, but also in the whole personalization piece, optimization, whether it's processes or business functions or whatever it might be. So permeating throughout this, this whole um, structure really is, is operations. It's absolutely key. Uh, to how an organization can 
well, in today's world, survive, but more importantly, thrive and ultimately grow um, and compete better in, in today's world and the future world. We look at three pillars, uh, customer excellence, operational excellence, innovation excellence. Uh, in fact, customer excellence was the subject of our, um, our last webinar, which was in September. So if you're interested in our thoughts and, and our guest speakers' thoughts uh, around that, please look, us up on, look that up on our website or on our YouTube channel. But today, really, it's that middle slice. We're looking at all things in a sort of operational excellence um, and how companies can and have um, worked in that space using digital maturity to help drive enhancements and ultimately better performance. Just very quickly, Digital Maturity Index is, is uh, our core service that we offer. We work with a lot of customers on this. Uh, in fact, hundreds of studies we've now done that we, um, we can talk about. Uh, I think Amir is going to dive into one of those studies a, a little bit later. Uh, but we look at six, what we call dimensions. Operations is absolutely one of those core six. But clearly, again, as I said before, the operational capability aspect and all things that relate to that, whether it's processes, automation, whatever it might be, sit probably largely through a lot of these, uh, these other dimensions, whether it's technology itself or customer uh, or, or whatever. So we would look holistically uh, with an organization at all of these aspects in quite a bit of detail, looking at digital maturity at that detail level on a scale of one to five, where one is really it's just defined, the digital capability is defined, but not really in play, all the way up to fully digitally in every way, uh, you know, automation, whatever it might be, um, you know, efficient digital processes, et cetera, integration. I don't think we've come across a company yet that are a true five. Uh, and again, Amir is going to be talking about the financial services studies that we've done and where some organizations are at least creeping up, up to that top end, which is good. And really just to finish on the digital maturity space, um, this is actually an extract from one of our output reports. Uh, so we work with customers to look at their current state, where they are uh, across these dimensions and, and the detail that sits below and put a scoring on that. Um, we actually look at past state as well, potentially. So where they were perhaps a year or two ago, where they are today, um, uh, but just as importantly or more importantly, where they're going. This is the target state here. And you can see we try and benchmark uh, this organization against best in class and also average from our benchmark database. And clearly there's a lot of detail that sits below this. Um, finally, to make that more real world and actionable, we define a number of initiatives and recommendations that customers can um, hopefully action uh, with a view to improving their scores, but also more importantly, increasing business performance or enhancing particular elements of customer experience or process efficiency or whatever it might be. Those initiatives are based on our experience, but also obviously at the analysis of the, the customer themselves. So just to give you a flavor really of, of how we see digital maturity, how we position it, how we work with our customers. Um, and before I hand over to, to Robin to talk uh, more specifically about his Aviva experience, we, we ran a recent study, um, our, our research team in a hundred uh, across 100 digital maturity studies that we've done in various sectors, uh, so financial services, retail, manufacturing, and a number of sectors. And we, we distilled that out into seven lessons. Clearly, there's a huge amount of analysis in there. Um, but interestingly, number seven was all around integration and very much that uh, operational space on the integration side and, and how actually it's a very important element um, of, of any kind of transformation um, and and would allow companies to operate better, whether that's integration at a technology level or even uh, you know across companies or even more at the business level from an integration perspective. And, and really sort of le leading on from that, I wanted to sort of hand over to Robin really, because I know from your experiences, Robin with Aviva um, and building, a, you know, creating that end-to-end -end digital business, I know um, there were challenges around um, sort of integration, cross-channel integration, et cetera. And I wondered if you wanted to talk about that for a few minutes. Sure, thanks, Mark. Um, so, um, uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, I, I was part of this uh, st startup, essentially, of the UK digital business, but um, that was obviously building on a pretty well-established direct-to-consumer business within Aviva. 
Um, and it, we created a separate legal entity really with a view of trying to accelerate digital across the business. Um, and the view at that point by the group chief executive was to put our arms around the full end-to-end -end activities in digital and direct to consumer. So we, we owned or, or either in direct hard report or, or uh, dotted line report, digital engineering, uh, the CX um, and UX design, uh, digital marketing, propositions development, innovation, uh, and a uh, data science team. Um, so uh, that gave us quite a lot of scope. We probably had um, overall about a thousand people, if you included a lot of them, all the devs as well. Um, we are accountable for uh, the direct to consumer business, so the PL for the direct to consumer business, and also engagement with customers post sale. So uh, insurance is often uh, an intermediated uh, sa sale, but there's a fair degree of post-sale uh, support, which is required, and, and we managed, managed that as well. What we didn't have was accountability for contact centers, which covered multiple channels. Um, so there's a fair degree of, uh, of activity needed to make sure that integration worked pro uh, properly. Um, we... Um, that really helped us, frankly. I mean, if you're thinking about a digital journey yourselves, getting an end-to-end an -end accountability really did help us, um, largely around giving us real clarity on our ambition about growing customer numbers, deepening customer relationships, um, improving customer experience, and, uh, and ultimately driving cross-sell and better retention. Um, it importantly allowed us to dramatically increase the pace at which we were developing. I mean, insurance isn't the fastest business on earth um, but we did manage to become really agile uh, not just in the scrum teams but end to end we, we set up um, category teams accountable for CX props um, uh, marketing and, and defining the, the, the backlogs for the scrum team so a real end-to-end -end accountability and autonomy to, to make their own decisions so we moved from you know annual planning to sort of replanning the whole business every three months and reprioritizing the portfolio and, and tweaking it every two weeks. Um, we were also, because we did see business and particularly because we had the data team, we were able to get much closer to the customer and we, you know, and made sure our decisions were made much more by customer need um, rather than our own, own preferences. The challenge, probably the biggest challenge we had was not owning the contact centers. Um, and we had to put quite a lot of effort in terms of cross-channel integration. So particularly things like handoffs from web journeys to phone journeys, making sure the data uh, that the contact agent saw is the same as, as a customer on the web saw. Uh, there's a fairly had heavy degree of, in of uh, investment needed to make that happen. And also multi-product journeys, because we, we had multi multiple contact centers for different products and, and trying to make those journeys seamless uh, was quite a challenge. Um, one of my biggest learnings, it was quite a journey over kind of three or four years, was the amount of communication um, we did and which was necessary to make this successful. And I probably spent about a third of my time communicating, uh, obviously internally, but with other internal stakeholders on the road, doing you know, lunch and learn sessions in the different sites, a uh, lot endless uh, webcasts and communications and, and town hall sessions. Um, but I, I think that really paid dividends in terms of helping integrate with those parts of the business, which we didn't have direct line accountability for. Excellent. Uh, and, and I think that that communication piece that you sort of um, finished off on there, um, Robin, is, is incredibly important. Um, and, and in some ways, you know, is, is part of the whole integration piece, because you could argue it's it's part of the integration within the organisation, not necessarily a technological integration. Um, but um, you know, leading into that whole sort of cultural and and and, and comms uh, aspect, really, to to any kind of transformation program. Um, I wanted to, to pull in uh, Jesus at this point, if I could, because I know a, a lot of your experience, uh, Jesus, has been in fintech and insure tech, and, and you look after the sort of fintech piece for for Grant Thornton currently. Um, you know, is there uh, sort of aspects from your experiences there? I guess particularly around that sort of integration or sort of you know ecosystems within uh you know the financial services world that that, that you'd be happy to share 
Yes, yeah, so I think you'll see, uh, Mark, it's very interesting that or even how Robin started saying that Aviva created an entity where they wanted to become an insure tech or can even sell a fintech because the different areas of the business that Aviva are targeting, maybe not potentially only insurance. And that's why I even thought for this particular talk, we, we could start uh, with open banking and how does that look like? Because I think that was really the catalyst, um, you know, for the likes of Aviva and others to start looking at, at this space. Um, you know, we initially started with banking and we saw the unbundling of financial services. Even on the, that's just an old map, but it just gives you an idea whereby, you know, different fintechs went into different particular pockets. And some went in FX and they say we're gonna change the FX. Some went into savings, we're gonna change savings, insurance and so forth. Um, and the bank can witness uh, this movement, and particularly in Europe, there was a body of work uh, at, at, from a regulatory perspective called PSD2, which actually drove it, and it was implemented uh, in 2019. But what insurance companies like Aviva and others are figuring out is this, that there's going to be a convergence in financial services for banking to insurance, asset management, and, and funds. And what we, we will see is a renaissance of bank insurance in particular. I think that will become more prominent now with, with, with open banking. So just to focus even on, on, on insurance, and uh, uh, because that will be the main topic in insurance tech going forward, but I thought it was important for us to start even looking at, at banking and how that will be unbundled. Uh, you know, likes of Starlin, uh, maybe we're missing it on, on, on the next slide, um, you know, gives that example. But at Grand Thornton, we said, okay, there are two really different ecosystems here. You know, one is uh, the financial services ecosystem. We, we know traditionally we talk about banking, insurance, asset management funds. And also there's an ecosystem layer of adjacent uh, verticals, which will come into financial services, leverage and fintech. And in, in, in the fintech space as well, I think there's a misconception uh, that insure tech is something and then, you know, reg tech, I think we call it everything fintech. And then there's teams within fintech. So, uh, you know, we would focus on the insure tech piece was what Robin was talking about. We see that as a big area because there's a big industry on its own. But even the things that, you know, we're speaking about here, it's just a high level, it, it will be a mash of insure tech and reg tech at the same time. Mm. Um, you know, just dismystify that a bit. Um, just unconscious of time, this just gives you guys a, a high level uh, of teams around uh, fintech and the pockets of what we're seeing. But coming back to the unbundling and bundling of financial services will happen over the next years, coming back to that integration piece that we're talking about today. Likes of Starling, they understood that. They understood the importance of integration, the importance of leveraging an ecosystem there because these different fintechs are going in and really becoming experts uh, of customer experience on the areas that they choose to, to target. So why reinvent the wheel? You have people that are obsessive about specific pockets. You might as well just partner with them, but, but be able to integrate their services into your platform quite seamlessly. Which is a challenging part, right? When you're talking about you know legacy players in the insurance space, in the banking space, in the you know in in the fund space and asset management, it's, it is a hard task. Um, but just give you also a high level of how these platforms look like. I think Starlet make it made it quite transparent. They said, okay, we want to partner with someone in, in loyalty. They just plug the loyalty partner. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to uh, partner with someone in savings. You can see there's three partners and so forth. There's one in insurance. And, and I think that's the key in all this, uh, um, uh, Mark, is uh, how do you leverage that fintech ecosystem and integrate it into your services? And I think we're going to talk more and more about it uh, you know, throughout the, this presentation around that data, that integration piece. Uh, but this gives you a high level of how that fintech ecosystem is helping this movement absolutely and and i know we are going to dive a little bit more into um, the sort of data and analytics side of it which <clears throat> i think is a hugely sort of powerful aspect of of fintech uh, and, and insure tech um sort of capabilities really uh because you know a lot of it is obviously based around very open apis um plugging and playing if that's the right yes. phrase um, and and not re i think you're absolutely right not reinventing the wheel that that's the key thing and i think for a lot of the you know my a lot of my experience with the, the, the bigger banks is for a long time they were struggling with their legacy um and trying to use their own internal it teams to you know work on quite large projects um, and struggling with the whole sort of data ecosystem and, and, and data management. And actually, I think in the last few years, you know, they've 
they've sort of moved much more to uh, you know if somebody's out there they're doing something great uh you know they're they it's, it's a robust service and it's uh, you know it, we can plug it in quite easily then that's where the focus has been you know these it teams i think have become much more sort of integration teams in a way than development teams um and and clearly they're calling on that very rich ecosystem that that's built up now particularly in as you say fintech insure tech and, and and reg tech also really interesting stuff really interesting stuff um I want to move on now, if I can, to look more at the sort of process and automation side of things, um, which sort of is a nice segue on, I think, from where we've been, uh, perhaps focused more on integration. Um, Amir, can I hand over to you to, uh, to perhaps take us through uh, uh, a, a few thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, so I'll, I'll just draw a conceptual framework around operational excellence and hand over to back to Jesus and Robin to share practical implications of that. So he, here's how we as Digitopia look at operations. Re regardless of the industry, operations is the business domain that correlates to an institution's productivity. And it, it's a complex domain, so it makes sense to break it down to components for better management. Here on this slide, you see four components uh, of operational excellence. First of all, you've got to have a solid foundation. And that basically is a board level thinking about how to prepare for the impact new technologies will have on the company's operations. And it requires having a clear direction aligned with company goals. And that direction should be led by a strong leadership. And of course, should be supplemented with the necessary resources, including talent, budget, etc. And channels is the second component. And that means designing processes across channels with customer experience as the focal point. And in order to deliver that experience, companies have to identify and track certain quality metrics, integrate channel flows for seamless journeys, and automate processes to the highest degree possible. So the channels component feeds into the enhanced customer service. Processes is the third component, and that basically relates to a frictionless and harmonious functional of the whole mechanism. Uh, that means increasing automation and the use of digital labor and intelligent systems, and that involves core services, support functions, and internal processes. Uh, it also requires establishing modern and secure IT systems that enable integration with third parties to support open banking, and as we just said, fintech, regtech, insurtech, whatever. And all in all, the processes component serves increased efficiency, speed, and diversity of services. And analytics is the last component, and it refers to how operational data is captured, organized, analyzed, and used for better operations, basically. And leveraging real-time data, machine learning, AI to make predictive and preventive decisions all fall into this component. So all in all, the capabilities across these components determine the overall maturity on the way to operational excellence. And maybe we could move on to the next slide at this point, Mark. Yes, uh, the, the overall maturity in the overall operational excellence ranges from a defined state where operations run in a structured manner on basic systems to a lean and autonomous state where process flows are optimized and focused on tangible outcomes. So basically that's how we see it. And I would like to turn to turn, turn back to Jesus now to talk about what kind of practice, practices you are running uh, on this journey to excellence. And can you give us some real time, real life examples, Jesus, about your journey to operational excellence? I think you can, you know, pick you back on even what Robin was talking about in terms of, uh, you know, advice and insurance companies. I think that's an interesting area for us to touch on, Amir, um, which where it becomes really, really, you know, practical and tangible. Because when you look at a, a robot advice, for example, there's a components of a short tech that you're going to bring in, there's components of, of reg tech that you're going to bring in, and there's components of well tech, for example, you can bring in. So you bring in like three models in to provide a very, very robust uh, robot advice, um, let, let's say in this instance. But I think the, the fundamental part, and there's the critical part in this, is how do you create that omni channel approach? Mm -hmm. Right, that uh, Robin touched on. But then how do you get a 360 degree view of the consumer? 
which is uh, is unbelievably hard, right? <laughs> we, we all know how hard this is to, to do, right? So that's why at, at times you have to really eat, eat it in chunks, as we say, right? You, you have to cut the elephant in chunks and really uh, target specific products and services and then build upon uh, the learnings. Because this is an agile process, you know, you, you learn to take from one and then you take, you take it in your other use case and, and so forth. And then you're going to end up with a very, very good, robust robot advice. So you could start with simple product uh, in terms of uh, advice, a simple, let's say a simple pension product. Um, it could be an annuity and then you can go into something more sophisticated uh, later on. Uh, as an example, right? But I think one of the things that we, even when you build something like this is first design principles, because we're talking about here about digitalization uh, and some people actually, when they approach this, they approach it from a digitization standpoint, which is, yeah. uh, you know, an insurance industry, you know how that ended. <laughs> you know, they took a form and said, okay, let's put it online and th there you go. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, that's the wrong approach. Um, and then if you're digitalizing you, as well, you have an opportunity now to reinvent your experience. We know insurance has been, uh, you know, been here for, for a while. Uh, and we know when uh, insurance was founded, uh, the technology that we have now was not present then. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they knew they had robots that could do chat, you know, chatbots, they could do advice, they probably would have built insurance in a different way. <laughs> you know, yeah. initially, it wouldn't have been built with a paper form experience in mind. So when I think I mean, when we're talking about uh, this concept of robot advice and integration uh, and fundamentally, you know, how we have the customer experience, I think we have to step back and look at first what what are we trying to achieve and how we reinvent that experience we call it first design principles and i mm -hmm. think robin will speak to that as well and how they went about doing it in in, in aviva because uh, it, it is a thought is a journey in the mind frame and, and a cultural shift uh, from uh, where a company is initially, and I think that's the hardest shift uh, because you have to you have to start thinking about different things that you didn't think about in the first place when you build the product or service. No, I, I think that's I think I think that they're all very good points there, and I think you're absolutely right. Some of this is a cultural mindset thing, and some of it is steeped in the history of you know, as you say, those products which have been around for you know almost hundreds of years in lots of ways um, and, and how they were administered back in the day, so to speak. And, and the world is so different today and, and how, well, the world is different, but also I think customer expectations are also very different uh, given the world has moved on and, and everything is immediate and online or, you know, accessible in every sort of channel, really. So I think, I think some really good points there. And, and uh, Robin, uh, it'd be good to bring you in here because... I know from your Viva experiences, there was some work that Aviva did in the sort of robo advice space. So it would be interesting to sort of get a, a view on that really and, and how that played into, you know, any changes that are in the wider organization really. Yeah, sure. So let, I'll, I'll focus on the uh, robo advice example. And I, I'm assuming, I mean, it's a, it's a very highly topical term in the uh, financial services sector for those on the call who aren't in financial services um, you know it, it's basically the addressing the issue or attempting to address the issue that financial advice tends to be an extremely long-winded and face-to-face -face process important process but a very long-winded one that can take hours that generally does take hours and the opportunity for robo advice is to uh, go down um, from you know several hour discussion to kind of getting invested in three clicks and that uh, hopefully no one from the FCA is listening. So I think <laughs> they are, I'm exaggerating to make effects, but, um, <laughs> but the, um, but um, so robo advice has been very topical uh, as part of um, the, the, my work in the digital business. Uh, we actually invested in a robo advisor um, uh, largely with a view that um, we needed to build that, bring in that capability and that, that ability to accelerate our, our, our work um, by by bringing people who, who who'd started from scratch in that space. So, we'd done some work in kind of direct to consumer investment platforms, which had been quite expensive and long winded. And we bought a small company called Wealthify, which had uh, just thirty five people based in Cardiff, um, but incredibly innovative and uh, and focused on their on their kind of key key thing, which is to simplify investing for for the masses, basically. Um, 
And just just to go back mm-hmm. to the point that Hazel's made earlier, but I think you showed a chart with Starling Bank um, and the Starling Bank marketplace. So Aviva had spent years, if possibly a, at least a year, talking to Starling about potential strategic collaboration and what have you. Uh, lots of high level meetings and with lots of different people. And in the scheme, in, in the midst of all that, Wealthify basically got hold of the API and integrated with Starling within a matter of weeks. I mean, the, the, the execution was like two weeks. So we, we brought, um, by bringing that capability in, we really brought an, a, a, an opportunity to massively accelerate our, our capability there. I, I don't know whether you, you mentioned RPA, um, and Aviva had done a fair bit of uh, robot, robotic process automation. Um, our, this was largely done with our, the outsource partners who would kind of acquire processes which need, you know, the outputs were pretty much defined and they had to improve the efficiency of them. So they would take processes that were done by people and get robots to do them. Mm. As a lot, as I'm sure you'll know, people on the phone, the challenge to, to RPA is it, it, you, you can automate bad processes and the core yeah. thing, core challenge is to it's actually to fix the process in the first place. And uh, Aviva had tried a, a, a attempt for several years uh, using a thing called systems thinking to think much more holistically about processes uh, before we kind of automating them. Yeah, and I, th- so, I think that's a, yeah. a very sort of valid point. Sorry, Robin, go on. No, I was gonna say, I think, I think, I think that's a very valid point, the whole automation piece. And, and in some ways that's probably uh, the subject of a, of a whole webinar in itself around automation and, and machine learning and, and ultimately, you know, the AI that everybody is talking about these days. Um, but, and I think, I think, you know, from my experiences, particularly with this sort of, uh, you know, in this sort of banking community, it, you have to be quite careful where you use RPA um, because it, on paper, it can give you tremendous benefits but as you say, if you're automating a bad process, then actually that can be counterproductive in lots of ways, uh, as well as not playing that well into, uh, you know, the, the people and cultural aspect of, of, you know, how people are operating in their day-to-day lives. So it's quite a big topic, probably one for a, we'll all get back together and talk about that one another time, perhaps. Um, so thank you for that, Robin and, and Jesus. I think that's a, a really interesting sort of view of um, that more sort of process automation piece. Uh, and the, 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 the sort of issues and, and challenges that sit around that. Um, Amir, I'd like to sort of bring you back in if I can, because one of the things we've done a lot of, I mentioned it earlier on, we've done an awful lot of these digital maturity studies now. Um, and I think one in particular we've, we've run recently in financial services has some interesting takeaways uh, generally, but I think in the operational space, when it comes to data, use of data analytics, I think there's some interesting takeaways there. Can I hand over to you to talk about that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so we are running a digital maturity research among banks and insurers in Turkey, and I'd like to share the interim results uh, with a focus on operations uh, to give an idea on how companies are performing. So for this research, we are leveraging our digital maturity index approach that you talked in the beginning. Uh, the interim results show that financial institutions are taking firm steps in in their digital journeys and banks are leading the way slightly ahead of the insurers. The overall maturity score, you see that on the left is 3.1 and I'll explain what that means in a minute. And in the middle of this slide, you see uh, the scores broken down by dimension. And I'd like you to focus on operations there. It's it's the second from the top with a score of 3.2. And again, I'll come back to that. And on the right, we see that there is a significant gap between laggards and the leaders in terms of operations. The laggards have a score of 2.1 and the best in class score 3.7. So what does all this mean? I'll explain that in the next slide. So the typical financial institution, overall, actually, we see that many companies have come a long way in operations, but, but zero ops is still a destination that's far away. And we define zero ops as a degree where all operational work is either eliminated or automated. Uh, So the the typical financial institution has a score of 3.2 and that means process flows are defined and being measured. A certain degree of integration, automation and paper elimination is reached. Uh, Our second finding is that the best in class has a score of 3.7 
And that means majority of processes are paperless. Uh, a range of key processes are designed seamlessly and omnichannel. And data flow from the front office to the back office is pretty fast. Uh, our third finding is that there is still room for development to realize the full potential of operational excellence. There is still room for simplifying further, engineering smarter, and automating at scale. And the fourth finding is actually a key one. Uh, executives view key success factors as data and analytics. So data capturing across systems and interpretation of the data are key to simplifying and automating operations at scale. So we know that data can be leveraged both to optimize the back office functions and also to enhance the customer experience on the front end. So it serves both ways and therefore has significant business value and it helps lowering costs to serve and also it helps establishing long-term and profitable relationships with the customers. So that's the overall picture in financial services in Turkey. And I'll turn to Robin now. Robin, I'm sure you agree with the view around the importance of data and analytics. And can you share with us some examples of how you use data to enhance operations and services and customer experience? Yeah, thanks, Amir. So, um... Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, the, the kind of the data science team uh, was part of uh, UK Digital and is absolutely fundamental to the success, success of the business. Um, Hess has actually mentioned the difficulty of creating a single view of the customer and, you know, whichever, you know, it's a, it's a painful reality that it's impossible to have a meaningful customer experience unless you've got a single view of the customer. And we spent a lot of effort um, building the the APIs and the connections to be actually able to look at a customer as an individual with a relationship with Aviva rather than a set of policy numbers, and and that's that's not to be underestimated in terms of the complexity. Um, the the benefit of that though is when you get a customer view, you can start doing really interesting things with the customer data uh, that you have, and and start you know on building on pretty granular segmentation to create really much more personalized customer experiences uh, and richer customer experiences. What, what, we, um, what we did at Aviva was, uh, to just take one example, um, uh, if you take home insurance quotes, they're generally um, quite long processes. So something that actually only costs a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred quid, you, you get asked about 140 questions to get a quote for home insurance if you go to a comparison website. Um, by identifying a customer and pulling together the data we knew about that customer um, and a bunch of public domain data on their house and where it was and the local crime stats and flood stats, et cetera, we were actually able to build a picture of uh, several thousand data points related to that customer, but actually only having to ask the customer three questions. So that was um, heavily data driven. Um, but actually, the, the experience was a much more attractive and, and, and easy customer experience. And, and to, the, to the extent that um, we actually used it as kind of the, the central point of one of our advertising campaigns last year, which um, some people might have seen where the kind of strap line was get a quote, not a, not a quiz. Um, and uh, all our kind of data scientists and actuaries were or bragging to their mums about how proud they were to see their their, their work publicised on TV. So, um, so that, that that's one example. I think hopefully giving hope to people that that the the benefit of heavy investment and pain in developing an SVOC is actually worthwhile. Excellent. I, I think we've talked before on this, Robin. The uh, I think that 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 story is is quite a remarkable one, really. That sort of 140 questions to three questions through the use of you know data and, and just saying those words massively underplays the effort involved there in single view of the customer external sources all of those things being uh, you know correlated and, and and brought together but i think you know and i do remember the it worked very well the the tv marketing campaign because it was quite startling at the time in terms of you know it, it can be as straightforward as that but um, all the work's going on behind the scenes, all the hard work. And, and I want to come on to sort of, Jesus, really to sort of build on that in terms of 
you know, use of data and analytics. Uh, one thing I was just going to say to the audience out there that I should have said at the beginning, if, there, if you've got any questions for the panel here, uh, please just pop them into the Q&A uh, section uh, within, uh, within your screen there. There should be a, a pop-up for Q&A, and if you put a question in there, it should then appear on our screens, and, and we're going to just have a few minutes at the end, hopefully, to uh, address any questions that you've got. But passing over to sort of Jesus, building on and what Robin and, the, and the, the example that Robin talked about there, it'd be interesting just to get your probably slightly wider view on, on that sort of data segmentation, customer data, I guess, really, Jesus. I think it's, it's, a, it's a great point, uh, you know, below Amir and Robin said, where you'll start, we'll start looking now at the customer segmentation in, in a digital uh, uh, platform. Uh, the opportunities are, are, are really endless with that, you know, first time principles thinking. If you even there's a, a, a sure everyone knows now, I, I won't give them an extra promotion here. You know, they do the content, uh, home insurance, uh, and uh, digital first uh, insurer. And they will, if you look at the traditional forms, they will have under 50 data points. The, this digital insurance has on the same journey with less friction, they capture over a thousand data points. Uh, so you can see the macro, from macro and micro segmentation that they can actually do and how can they dynamically then price on the right of reserve. And I think that data science will become key uh, more prominent in insurance industry, more pervasive um, as, we, as we have to understand data. You know, there, there's a lot of actuaries now retraining themselves into either data scientists, and I think it's a key thing. So today, I was just said uh, I'll put here, you know, some of the, some principles that, that are applicable to insurance. That the the ton of them, you know, if we're looking at just the, the behavioral science principles, you can count over hundred, and it grows day on day. But this comes from uh, that data reality studies that human beings by nature are irrational, you know. So, um, you know, we have to just understand when we're doing that granularity, what level of irrationality the customer is at, <laughs> if, you can, if, you can, if you can joke uh, with it a, a bit, because by nature, is insurance is not a product that you're going to go and say, okay, I want to get in the morning, I want to interact with a lot. So you have to understand the level of appetite, the uh, adverse uh, the risk the insurance uh, consumer is at at any particular point in time. So I think that's a as a key thing that is going to be we're going to see more and more in the insurance industry. Uh, I'll give you let's just discuss one here: decision by paralysis. You know, if you put too many options in front of an individual, particularly when they're doing financial advice, uh, you know, it could they could be paralyzed and then they end up taking no decision, which is not what we want, right? We want people to go in their path of financial security. All right, um, and just building up on that because I know we're we're a bit tight for time. But if we circle back to everything we've been discussing today about that single customer view, um, it, which is hard to do, right? Uh, and then when you gather all that data, you know, to that hyper personalization segmentation, there is an interesting company also out of Japan which they created our funds based on your own interest, right? So you now invest into a pension fund and you can invest the pension fund based on sushi or based on puppies, you know? <laughs> and this is the level of engagement that, you know, now uh, this kind of first design principles, you can go into and then we can talk about technology behind of that. Let's say if we wanted to put some DLT this is really legend technology on the back. You can even see where the sushi was, you know, was actually, you know, caught if you if you chose that, right? Yeah. Uh, which one consumers will interact with that? Okay, uh, I'm investing in the sushi fund, and then I want to know, okay, where were all these sushi caught? Uh, and all of a sudden, now they become more uh, connected with their financial product, right? So it, all this will create a massive opportunity for financial services uh, and banking and insurance has some management and funds going forward. And I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, this movement now, this integrated uh, view of the customer and where we will lead us to service them better. I, absolutely. And I think that sort of, I don't know if it's the right term, but that sort of hyper-personalization, you know, is becoming a, a huge thing really. And um, I think even in the recent months, you know, customer expectations of have changed the world has changed for all of us and i think customer expectations have changed you know with people being very much sort of for a long time confined at home that whole sort of delivery services or um you know that last mile delivery has become incredibly important and and how you interact with companies to get exactly what you need when you need it um and i, and I think all that's happened there really is a, a progression that has been happening for a number of years has just accelerated in lots of ways 
you know, the whole sort of know your customer, uh, which I know is more of a FS term, but in the broadest sense, know your customer is, is becoming incredibly important. Um, and certainly we found from our digital maturity studies, customer is one of our dimensions and um, it, it, it's an incredibly key one because, and, and we found more and more emphasis on it, as you can imagine over the last couple of years, um, as that whole sort of customer centricity piece as you know, customer journeys and, and focusing on your customer more even so than you know other more technological aspects, perhaps, which is where people were a few years ago. Um, some re very, very, really interesting points there. Um, I'm conscious of time. I'm just, just going to have a look, see if we've got any questions sent through. Uh, we've got one which is around, uh, oh, we've got a, oh, we've got a few appearing. Right, OK, so um, we've got one from Richard. Uh, any comments uh, on fintech and tech maturity in the UK and Europe versus the US? I don't know, Jesus, do you have a, a sort of view on that? I, I think the US is, has an interesting landscape uh, because, uh, you know, innovation in the US born of Silicon Valley, born of incredible experimentation, you know, and that aggressive, okay, learn fast, fail fast culture. Yeah. And that led with, uh, you know, is led by a lot of funding, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you have to be able to take those risks. Um, in UK, uh, to be honest, uh, in fairness, uh, the structure of the FCA we've put in place with the sandbox, um, you know, there was one of the pioneers, actually, in UK and Europe with, with, with the sandbox. Of course, now there's a different version of the sandbox when you go first, you know, going to get it right the other jurisdictions that build up on the knowledge from the UK. But mm -hmm. I think uh, in UK, they didn't have that aggressive uh, level of funding, uh, you know, going to the fintechs, but they have the robustness of uh, governance uh, per se, because when you are building a fintech, it's not the same as building any other tech company. There are a lot of uh, risks, uh, you know, involved with the fintech. So I think the UK, um, the, uh, when it comes to Europe, well subsidized, good governance, and then Ireland as well is building out on the back of that now. The right. Central Bank of Ireland, uh, it, it, probably you heard now, uh, if you really pass through the Central Bank of Ireland's uh, process, you, you'll be gold plated, as, as you say. So, <laughs> you know, it's one of the uh, toughest processes to go through, but it gives you gold marks. But on the back of that, uh, I would like to see more funding, uh, you know. In going into the ecosystem in, in, in Ireland. But there's other jurisdictions like they've done quite well, uh, you know, likes of France, Germany, and, uh, you know, in Europe. Uh, but they, if we look at uh, other jurisdictions outside Europe, I think Israel is one that everyone talks about just because of the tech nature as well, the ability mm -hmm. to de deploy capital. Um, but if we look at a, a, a sound and fintech uh, ecosystem, I think Europe if we look at the regulatory framework that is there for a fintech as a roadmap and structure, it's very prescriptive. So if we, if we look at what uh, the likes of Europe did with the PSD2, uh, mm -hmm. and they put that in place, GDPR, they put, that in, they put that in place. These are all foundations to an open data ecosystem where Europe already produced a paper on their digital uh, future as well, which I think building a fintech in Europe is very prescriptive. You have the challenges around funding, but you have a lot of substance and, and history that you can leverage on. Maybe yeah. Robin can touch on that uh, because he, he would have seen as well a lot of fintechs uh, popping out uh, in the UK. And known ones that I guess well, I don't want to give them more promo, but uh, they're, they're, they're very, very successful ones <laughs> that, that came out of the UK. They're unicorns now, right? So. Course. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd sort of say, um, I mean, I, I must say, my, you know, given this ocean of money in uh, in private equity in the States, I mean, the, the, I, I would actually put them quite a long way ahead of, the, of Europe. Um, and in terms of the innovations, you know, there's things like well, in robo advice, you've had the likes of Wealthfront, etc., for several years ahead of the UK. Um, Metro Mile is kind of the paper mile insurer, which has been, you know, is well established in the US. Um, Lemonade is this kind of, you know, extremely seamless home insurer based out of New York and now growing. They're, they're less successful in growing outside the US into Europe. Um, it might be the nature of, fintech, of the finance and insurance network, but uh, certainly, it's certainly, I, th I would put them ahead of maturity. Uh, but not to, not to diss the, uh, the level of innovation that is going on in the UK, I mean, the, the whole kind of Shoreditch world is is real hive of innovation, and, and there's there's plenty of plenty of good stuff going on there as well. 
Excellent. I think we've, we've got time just for one final one. It's, it's aimed at you, Robin, actually, and, and whether you'd be able to comment on it. It was um, last year, Aviva's then CEO said he was cutting back on digital spend uh, as it wasn't delivering enough return. And it, I guess it was just to get whatever thoughts you'd got on that, really. Did, uh, did those cutbacks happen and what impact did it have on digital growth? Um, and so whether you're well, able it depends to on, on it. I mean, I think the simplest way of summarizing that is, is he's no longer there. <laughs> I think that's a very, a very, uh, a very good and a very sort of uh, measured answer, really, because it was going to be a difficult question anyway. I was going to sort of step in anyway to uh, to say it's it's not one we can talk particularly about specifically. But yes, interestingly, uh, changing of the guard there, I guess. So uh, read into that what you will. Um, that's sort of it for questions. Uh, it just remains for me to say thank you ever so much uh, for our panelists today. To Robin, to Jesus, and to Amir. Uh, hopefully, uh, the audience has got quite a lot of that in terms of insight and just our general view of the world. And 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 hopefully, that's been interesting as well. Um, just finally, to forward point to the next one in our series will be November, November the nineteenth. Digital maturity. Uh, we'll be looking at the uh, governance aspect which is interesting because Jesus touched on that there right at the end uh, in terms of uh, fintech and insurtechs I'm sure we'll be uh, we'll be heading into that space but remains me to say thank you ever so much to everybody thank you for everybody out there for uh, joining us today hopefully you found it of interest and we shall see you all again soon thank you guys thank you thanks a lot thanks. take care everybody take care bye